I'm Colin Sanders and you're listening to the History Books Review. I read history books and I review them. The Hymn to Cybele by Julian the Apostate The Roman Emperor Julian the Apostate is a one-off in history. He was the nephew of Constantine, the man that introduced Christianity to the Empire, but he spent most of his adult life trying to convert it back again. He was born a Christian and died a pagan. He was a philosopher by inclination. He could easily have been remembered as a leading exponent of Neoplatonism, but proved to be a great warrior when forced to become one. Above all, he was full of surprises. So, naturally, I was interested when I found his hymn of praise to the goddess Sibylle online. I couldn't find out anything about how it came to survive or what else is known about it, so all I can say is what I have gleaned from the document itself. It sounds like a speech given at a religious occasion. I assume it was given in Athens, since the Athenians are specifically praised in it. And given that bits of it are rather unpolished and rambling, it sounds a lot like it was a written record made by somebody who was present when the speech was being given. Reading it aloud took about 40 minutes, about the length of time a reasonable speech might take. As such, it is a pretty rare chance to listen to someone speaking in their own voice from the ancient world, and it is a speech from one of the most interesting characters from that world. Very few people can talk to an audience off the top of their heads, so I imagine Julian had done some kind of preparation. Even so, his ability to talk on his feet is impressive. Accounts of him from his own time report that he was likeable and engaging, and reading this speech made that easy to believe. It is less easy to work out why he made it, and to who. It sounds to me like he was consecrating a new temple, or more likely, reconsecrating one that had been desecrated. Whoever was listening, Julian has high expectations of their intellectual ability. He doesn't hold back on the full details of his Neoplatonic philosophy, and to follow him you would have had to have a pretty good grasp of who Plato, Aristotle and Epicurus were, and what their teachings were about. We get to hear what Julian himself thinks of these leading lights of Greek thought. Epicurus is dismissed. He is just plain wrong. Aristotle has made himself ridiculous by diverging from Plato. It is Plato that is regarded as the authority. The only other person who gets much credit is Porphyry, the man who had reinterpreted Plato's ideas for Julian's time. As we'll see, Julian is interested in how Sibylle fits into the general metaphysical system of the Neoplatonist philosophy to which he subscribed. But today, we probably first have to answer the more basic question of who Sibylle was in the first place, given that she isn't one of the gods whose name is still part of everyday speech. The cult of Sibylle goes back a long way, and she may well have originally been worshipped as an earth mother way back in prehistory. The origin of her worship was in Phrygia. This is the region of central Turkey, roughly where the current capital of Ankara is. There are a lot of respectful and knowledgeable references to Phrygia and its culture in the Hymn to Sibylle. Enough to make me think that there may have been some Phrygians in the audience, or indeed the speech may have been given somewhere in Phrygia. The Phrygians were closely related to the Greeks, and early on the Athenians had picked up the worship of Sibylle from them. In fact, they had built a temple to Sibylle in Athens and um, stored the public records in it. The Phrygians must have had a good marketing department, because when the Romans were in trouble during their war with Carthage, they turned to Sibylle for divine support. A 
statue of the goddess was commissioned directly from Phrygia and dispatched to Rome in a large ship. When the vessel approached the Tiber, the city's inhabitants turned out to greet it, led by the priests and the senators. Unfortunately, it got stuck in the mouth of the river and nothing would move it. The rumour arose that the chief vestal virgin, Clodia, had not been sticking to the purity of her vows and this was offending the goddess. Stories like that tend to spread. In order to clear her name, Clodia wrapped her girdle around the statue. As a result, the boat finally started moving, getting the delivery back on plan. Julian was telling this story some 500 years after the event, but had no truck with people who were sceptical about it. Julian insists on taking the story at face value. There were plenty of testimonials attesting to it. It also fitted in with his idea that the gods took an active interest in human affairs, intervening when the need arose. The Romans went on to be highly successful in their fight against Carthage. Sibylle was obviously effective as a protector. She rapidly became one of the most popular gods in town. Augustus built a huge temple to her right next to his own palace. But Julian is more interested in her religious significance than her history. He asks, who is the mother of the gods? He then proceeds to answer his own question in great detail. As a pupil of Neoplatonism, he was intensely interested in the metaphorical significance of these kinds of myths. We get a lot of detail of the philosophical meaning of it all. This is pretty involved, going deep into Plato's theory of forms and with references to Aristotle, Porphyry, Theophrastus and Xenagoras. And this isn't simple name dropping. Julian has clearly read them and understood their arguments and feels quite able to put his own ideas forward in the same company. It's tough going, believe me, but he eventually gets where he wants to go. Sibylle is identified as the greatest being created by the One and the goddess who transfers creative urges from the divine mind down to earth. Having warmed up with this fairly major metaphysical explanation, he goes on to draw some conclusions about how one of the stories about Sibylle could be used to explain the path of the sun in the sky. He then seems to get a bit sidetracked with quite a bit of rather unfocused speculation about the origin of particular dietary restrictions required by traditional religious practices. As we all know, the cleverest of speakers can wander off topic and end up forgetting what they are supposed to be talking about. But Julian pulls it back. He finishes with a simple and sincere prayer to the goddess. Grant unto all men happiness, of which the sum and substance is the knowledge of the gods, and to the Roman people universally, first and foremost, to wash away from themselves the stain of atheism, and, in addition to this, grant them propitious fortune that shall assist them in governing the empire for many thousands of years to come. To myself, grant for the fruit of my devotion to thee truth in belief concerning the gods the attainment of perfection in religious rites and in all the undertakings which we attempt as regards warlike or military measures, valour coupled with good luck, and the termination of my life to be without pain and happy in the good hope of a departure for your abodes. The reference to the stain of atheism is poignant. Julian may have been making a general point, but... I can imagine that he was speaking in a temple that still had signs of damage. Atheism referred to Christianity, Christians by not accepting the platonic concept of a single transcendent God who was the source of creation justified the atheist tag according to Julian's point of view, though it's a bit confusing from our way of thinking. Many temples have been attacked and destroyed during the previous 40 years uh, under the reign of Constantine and his sons. Many had been converted into churches. Julian's love and veneration for the gods of his country is evident, 
and he must have found the evidence of this desecration heartbreaking. But the buildings could be restored. The loss of the tradition was much harder to make good. This culture, once destroyed, could not be revived. Julian himself, being brought up as a Christian, must have felt keenly this break with the past, but at least as emperor he could now save what was left. He wasn't to know that it was not to be. His reign didn't even last two years, and when he was gone it was not long before the destruction resumed. Steadily more severe laws against pagan practices were brought in, stripping them of rights and forbidding their literature. Paganism did not die out, it was killed. Much of our culture has been lost forever. Julian failed to save it, but at least he put up a fight, and a visible one. Julian will certainly never be forgotten. His hymn to Sibylle is both a window on a world that has been destroyed, and a reminder that there were people who cared deeply about it.